We're incredibly excited about our upcoming auction. It's a first of its kind dedicated sale uh, focusing on the works of J.H. Pirniev, one of the most recognizable artists uh, in, in the South African canon. Uh, we have over 60 lots in the sale, um, which is enormously exciting, of course. Everything is hanging in our Johannesburg sale rooms. Uh, it's an enormous pity that we don't have floods of people coming in uh, to have a close look at everything. It is essentially a standout Pirniev exhibition. Um, and as I say, enormously sad that we don't have uh, more people uh, coming in to look. Uh, we do have a virtual gallery, so please do go to our website, click on our Matterport link, and you'll be able to move around the space um, just like you would if you were here in person and, and have a close look at all the fantastic uh, examples in the sale. Um, we will do a quick uh, additional virtual walkabout now. Um, maybe starting with this uh, incredible, very, very early work by Pirniev. This is, in fact, the earliest example I've ever seen uh, in the flesh. It dates from 1901. It shows a, a man digging with a companion, a uh, potentially resting, um, sitting up against the tree in the background. It's very, very dark. It's very low countries in its palette. And that's because he was in Holland when he painted this. Uh, the Pirniev family went into exile uh, when the Anglo-Boer War broke out in 1899. In 1900, they went to Holland. They settled in Hilversum initially and then went to Rotterdam. This, in 1901, would have been painted in Hilversum. What are we seeing here? We're seeing a very clear influence of the sort of so-called Dutch masters um, that Pirniev would have been exposed to um, during this initial trip. Very dark palette, uh, dark browns, greys, um, sort of murky mustards and creamy whites that you see particularly uh, in the highlights. Also, I think you can't look at a picture like this without thinking about the 19th century French realists, uh, artists like Millet and Coubet. Uh, this is as close as a young Pirniev would have ever got uh, to those fantastic 19th century uh, French realists. The light, of course, is a European light, um, highly unlikely, no matter the weather conditions, uh, that he would have seen something like this um, in his native South Africa. Fabulous little work, uh, very exciting provenance, um, and, and it's wonderful to have a work uh, from this period. Anyway, the Pirniev family returned to Pretoria in 1903. Uh, Pirniev was still essentially a very young man. He was desperate to paint, desperate to become a full-time artist, but that simply wasn't really an option for him uh, at, at that point. He worked for a brief time at his father's tobacconist shop, Ludwig de Jager's tobacconist shop, and we've sold in the past some incredible watercolors uh, from that very odd period uh, in, in Pirniev's career. At this time, um, this is now before the Union, before 1910 uh, and there and thereabouts, uh, Pirniev is spending some time with a number of pretty remarkable Heifelt artists uh, who are working then. Artists like Franz Urda, um, Anton van Vaux, George Smithard, Peter Venning, some of the most spectacular early 20th century uh, South African masters. At this point, he was also spending a lot of time out in the felt uh, with, with these artists. He would go on, on numerous trips with uh, particularly his, his godfather, uh, Anton van Vaux, out into the felt, out onto the outskirts of Pretoria, where they would sketch plain air. Um, I think these were enormously happy times for a young Pirniev. He was uh, very much free to, uh, to work in the way he wanted to, to sketch in the way he wanted to, yet he still had these amazing uh, older mentors. This is one of his tent sites uh, from around this period. Um, a lovely painting in, in its own right. I suppose as close to uh, Venning and maybe Urda uh, as Pirniev would, would ever get. Um, these, this heavy canvas sort of under this uh, high felt sun. You get a sense of summertime or springtime with that, uh, that wonderful green foliage and this typical clear high felt sky. Also at around this time, uh, Pirniev is experimenting, learning uh, the various arts of printmaking. Uh, initially, he, he worked uh, with etchings and, uh, and wood engravings, and it's always very difficult to know exactly who were his major mentors uh, in that medium. Um, I think it's 
most likely now uh, agreed that it was George Smithard who had one of the earliest and biggest influences on Pierneuf as a printmaker, but of course he also would have been influenced by the likes of, of Franz Urda uh, and Venning, who was a, a, a master etcher um, in, in his own right. We have this incredible work uh, called View Through Trees, uh, and uh, this is dated probably to 1912, so a very, very early uh, etching. Um, when did he start etching? When were his first etchings? Well, we don't really know. Probably sometime between 1908 and 1911. Uh, this one, as I say, dates from 1912. Uh, you'll see it's numbered one of one, so uh, essentially a very, very small edition, although he did make more of these uh, particular works. It's very, very small. It's very delicate. Uh, it is incredibly uh, inscribed and etched. It has in the past been catalogued as a European town. Um, and I think that, uh, well, that has changed. I think if you speak to um, specialists like Gerard de Kamper, I think it is agreed now that this is in fact a view of Pretoria. Uh, most likely made from a photograph uh, because the church uh, would have been um, ha would have been flattened uh, by this time uh, before being rebuilt. I'm not sure how much detail you can see, but we will, we will give you some detailed shots. There is incredible workmanship already um, in, in, in an etching like this. I particularly love the way the trees um, have been built up with these wonderful, swirling, sinuous uh, line work. To me, he couldn't have done a work like this without a very clear understanding of European trends, particularly Art Nouveau. Um, and bearing in mind he was working in the State Library in Pretoria at the time, uh, where he would have had his main exposure through books, it's quite remarkable uh, that he could have picked up those kind of European trends so easily, so naturally, um, and, and included it in his very, very early etchings. Remarkable, rare, quite spectacular and we're very very excited uh, to have a work like this uh, in the sale. Staying with Pierneuf's early career, uh, this work on paper is one of my favorites in the sale. Uh, it, it is of course a depiction of Pierneuf's beloved willow tree. Now it dates from 1915, which is shortly after his first exhibitions. He exhibited initially with the Individualists in 1911 and 1912. Now, the Individualists were a small, like-minded group of Pretoria artists, including the likes of Peter Venning. Um, he then had his first solo show at J.H. Debussy in 1913, right next to the Kudu Butchery uh, in Pretoria. And this work, as I say, from 1915, uh, would, have, would have been produced shortly after that first solo show. Pierneuf was devoted to the willow tree early on in his career. I think a lot of us, uh, when we think of Pierneuf, we think of these fantastic uh, sort of sky-reaching acacias uh, in the bushveld, but the, the willow tree really had his heart early on. Um, when he moved into his first home on Duval Street in Pretoria uh, with his first wife, Agatha, they had an enormous willow tree in their garden, and Pierneuf uh, talks about how he knew that tree intimately. He knew every twist and gnarl in, in the bark and, uh, and its branches. So it's always fantastic to see an early willow tree depiction. This one is in pastel on paper. It has this wonderful um, sort of decorative root system at the bottom and of course these heavy hanging golden fronds. We always talk about the negative spaces in Pierneuf's early work. He saw enormous decorative potential um, in, in these negative spaces with this fantastic clear high felt sky uh, in the background. That's 1915. He's still working at the State Library at this point. Late in 1917, however, he resigns uh, and he takes up a position um, in Heidelberg teaching. Um, which is where we catch him here in this work. This was probably produced on the 1st, 2nd, or perhaps 3rd of January, 1918. As I say, he had recently uh, resigned from the State Library and he was looking forward to a new job, um, a, a, a new way of living, uh, teaching, but a lifestyle that would have given him more time to work and to paint. 
This is, of course, the Villa Arcadia. We had a similar work in our sale room, I think about a year ago, uh, which, which is what helped us date it so specifically to the first, first days uh, of January 1918. We are seeing the pergola here of, of Villa Arcadia, and frankly, a masterclass of, of, of watercolor uh, painting. Uh, of course, you see the obvious uh, technical perspective, but the real joy in a painting like this is this rusty colored bougainvillea um, and the incredible um, dappled shadows and light it creates um, on this white wall and, and, and on the floor here. It's also worth bearing in mind uh, that Pionyev, even at this point, was a master architectural draftsman. Um, his father was a builder, and I think his father would have loved him to become an architect, uh, but he also spent some time um, working under a, an architect in Holland in 1901-1902, and as I say, by this stage, uh, he was a master architectural draftsman. Where should we go next? I'm going to take you all the way across the room uh, to talk a little bit more about some of his liner cuts. Uh, I mentioned the etching earlier on. It's the only etching in our sale, and his etchings are incredibly rare. He is best known, of course, for his liner cuts. And we have this fabulous wall behind me uh, of liner cuts. I think we have uh, 23 or so liner cuts in the sale, uh, which is a, a real coup. And to have them all together, or to have so many of them together, uh, is, is fascinating. And you see what an incredible impact uh, this black and white uh, decorative effect has. First and foremost, I, I need to say that there's always a bit of a problem when it comes to dating and numbering uh, Peony of Prince and particularly his liner cuts. And that's because generally he never numbered his liner cuts. Um, you need to remember that at the time they were being produced in the teens and the 1920s, there was no strict market, no strict way of um, recording prints and multiples like there is today. At the end of the day, Peonyev would make a plate and he would pull prints himself. Uh, he had his own press. Um, he didn't need any master printer to collaborate with. He was his own master printer. But when he would make these plates and pull these impressions, he would sell them, he would give them away as gifts, and he would keep the original plates with him in his studio. And perhaps later on, sometimes years later, um, he would pull out that same plate again if there was demand, and he would make a few more prints um, depending on what was required. He never limited himself with numbers, edition numbers. Why on earth would he? At the end of the day, he was a professional artist. Uh, he would try and sell as many of his prints and multiples as there were buyers out there. But what that has produced is some confusion. That you'll often find the same print dated and sometimes titled differently. And that's purely because Peonyev's memory was imperfect. So sometimes he would take out a plate, he would pull an impression and he would either date it according to that moment uh, as the ink dried or he would try and think back and date it according to when he made that initial plate. Similarly, sometimes he would title it um, relying on his memory, which is why there's often a lot of variance. It's also, I think, what makes collecting Peonyev's prints and multiples so incredibly exciting. You can have the same print in so many different guises. Anyway, I spoke about the willow tree a little bit earlier, and here is another fantastic example uh, of the willow tree in liner cut. I spoke about the negative spaces earlier, and wow, look at the incredible negative spaces in, in a liner cut like this. Um, almost like a stained glass window, uh, the way he creates these very dark outlines, uh, but he leaves the negative spaces there as very much part of the decorative effect. Think again of those uh, very sinuous lines in that etching that I showed you initially, the view through a tree, view, view through trees, and look at it here, uh, slightly more stylized, slightly stronger uh, in, in, in the line and contours, and that's because, of course, he's working in liner cut as opposed uh, to etching. This is one of his earlier works, um, al although this particular one is from 1920. Uh, you'll see a little IMPR in many of these works. Uh, that indicates that Pionyev himself 
pulled this impression. Naturally, he pulled all of his impressions, but it's just a little note to say uh, that he is not only the artist, uh, but the printmaker too. I love this work, um, McClala's Kral or, 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 or Petersburg in the old Transvaal, uh, linking his very clear interest in vernacular architecture, but also conflating uh, this traditional architecture with this background copy. Uh, it's sometimes hard to tell where the natural world starts, where the copy starts, and uh, the architectural elements begin or end. Fabulous work, this particular one, pulled quite late in the artist's life in 1951. I can't think of many prints I've seen dating from the 1950s. The actual plate would have been made uh, literally decades uh, prior to that. The Hermanus Harbour, famous uh, in so many ways, in Pirniev's canon, perhaps most famous as one of his station panels. He chose this almost exact scene, this exact vantage point for one of his 28 uh, location panels for the Johannesburg Railway Station produced between 1929 and 1932. You'll get a sense of the different scale of all these works, a little small work of the Sphinx uh, over there, and another early work um, o Purki from Stellenbosch, probably from 1921. This fantastic uh, sort of uh, gateway um, still very much exists in Stellenbosch. If you happen to be in Stellenbosch, you can, you can go and look at it or, or have a look on Google Earth. If you don't quite know where it is, just look up Specsavers, because Specsavers starts over here um, in, 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 in current day Stellenbosch. Um, I would argue a lot more atmospheric in 1921, which is when Pirniev uh, very importantly visited Stellenbosch. Uh, he had a major show there in, in early in 1921 and then came back to the Cape and had another show later on that year in Cape Town in 1921. At this point, he was a uh, full-time artist. He had made the plunge, essentially, and he was trying to uh, build a career as a full-time artist. Um, the works he produced in, those, uh, in that brief period in the Cape in 1921 are fabulous. And we have a few examples, including this one here, uh, this vineyard um, in Stellenbosch with the twin peaks beyond. Uh, this is dated 1921, so presumably painted on that very first trip. It is atmospheric, it is impressionistic in the way it's painted, these fabulous flecks of cream and pink and lilac, and also the vineyards in these speckled greens. Jon Krusuk rises up in the background, a, uh, a dusky depiction, I, I think, of, of Jon Krusuk, uh, almost a hazy depiction, the fabulous, famous silhouette, uh, which he would return to countless times uh, in, in his career, is so beautifully depicted in, in an impressionistic work like this. Now, when he was in Stellenbosch in 1921, he met a good number of the Afrikaans intelligentsia. People like Twin van der Heerwe, um, also people like Hans Aschenborn, people who had a very close link to the then Southwest Africa. And some of those people tried to convince Pirniev to go to Southwest Africa as it was known then. They felt he would, be, he would have been blown away by the vistas, the landscape, the air, the light. Um, and anyway, he makes that trip in 1923. He goes, I think, in the April of 1923, he goes to Vintuk, and he is, as uh, so many of his friends had predicted, blown away by that landscape. And he paints furiously uh, on his first trip in 1923. He travels the country as best he can. He's working on a small scale, on small little panels. Why? Because practically he needed to move around with, with smaller, hardier equipment so he could uh, paint plain air um, as, as he moved around. We have three fabulous works from this period. And I say this period because he returned to Southwest Africa in 1924. This fabulous work uh, is dated 1923, so it would have been produced on that first trip. But look at the color, look at the palette of these Southwest African scenes. They have this incredible charged atmosphere full of pinks and lavenders and purples. His palette changes dramatically um, because of his trip to Southwest Africa. 
Also, I think he has a new lease on life in terms of uh, feeling liberated with his palette. He, um, I think, realizes he can uh, paint in a far more dramatic way than he had been painting beforehand. His early influences, remember, are a bit more conservative, a bit more traditional people like Urda and Venning and George Smithard and even someone like Roweth. Uh, in, in the Cape. He's doing something completely different now in 1923, 1924. These little sketches are some of the spectacular jewels of 20th century landscape painting uh, in South Africa, and we're very lucky to have three of them um, in the sale. Anyway, that's 1923 uh, and 1924. I'd like to talk a little bit about his process. Um, we all imagine PNF out in the felt, camping, traveling, and working plain air, and he very much did that. That was at the core of his process. He needed to be out in the landscape, seeing and drawing what was in front of him. But what a lot of people don't realize is that was those drawings he made out in the felt, the sketches he made out uh, in the felt, were essentially still um, sources to be worked up in the studio into grander, uh, larger scale exhibition canvases. His drawings are an incredibly important part of his process, and we do have a good number of them in this sale. I don't think you could have a PNF exhibition without looking carefully at his fabulous drawings, and he was an incredible draftsman. Um, perhaps we can look at these three uh, by way of example. This one from 1924, Bay Brits, uh, in the Transvaal, uh, and you get a sense of PNF sitting on his stool, uh, literally sketching, taking down very quickly what is in front of him. Uh, in this particular composition uh, it, it, it is very horizontal. It's a long, almost freeze-like composition. And of course, he's focusing on uh, his uh, beloved acacias uh, in the felt. He's also editing a scene like this very heavily and very specifically, I would argue. I doubt there were just three or four outcroppings of trees uh, in this particular view. I expect there were many, many um, additional elements in this landscape, but he pairs it down, he pulls it back, and he just draws out, I think, what he wants in a composition. And one wonders what kind of final composition this would have been turned into. There are many occasions where we know exactly um, how he translated sketches like this into final large-scale canvases, but this is a, a very important moment in his process. This work, we know, was done in October 1924 in Usakos in southwest Africa, so this done on his second trip uh, to the then southwest Africa. I love this drawing for so many reasons. First and foremost, it's just a spectacular quick sketch. You, uh, as I say, get a real sense of him being there, looking at these trees, looking very carefully at the weight, how they bend, how they, uh, how, how they move in the breeze. Um, he's also looking very carefully at this uh, rocky mountainous outcrop in the background. He's making decisions all the time. Where must the horizon uh, line cut the page? At what point um, should it cut these tree trunks? Of course, depending on his vantage point, he could change that very quickly uh, and very deliberately. I also love the fact that in this particular work, you get a sense of this being a real working drawing. Look at some of the sort of watermarks and smudge marks in this. He wasn't producing this work in order to hang it up in a gallery. It was a working drawing that he could take back to the studio and translate into uh, numerous other uh, drawings and sketches. And I, I suppose, no, I'll get, I'll get onto that in a moment. He has another one, this from 1936. Again, he is uh, editing what he sees in front of him, but he's also looking at um, a, a landscape extending into space. Uh, he's looking at different colors, what different colors would work. Um, and in a spectacular watercolor like this of Riesberg over here, you actually see him labeling these colors. So getting a real sense of how he works. This is much later. This is from 1953, a spectacular watercolor. But see how he labels all the colors. Uh, green, brown, creole. Uh, he's got um, a working idea in his mind about what he's going to do later on in the studio in a work like this. 
Where are we in his life story? Well, we got up to 1923, 1924. Well, in 1925, he and his second wife, May, um, make an enormously important trip to Europe. They arrive in London in, in, in the middle of 1925. They catch the tail end of the British Empire exhibition at the time. And they spend the next, what, seven months uh, traveling predominantly on the continent. They spend a lot of time uh, in the Low Countries, a lot of time um, in, in, in Holland, Belgium. Uh, they go to France, they go to Germany. And Pienev is exposed for the first time, really, as a mature artist to these incredible new European modernisms. And just like he was blown away um, with the isolation of the Southwest African landscape, he is, or his mind is buzzing in Europe uh, when he's exposed to all these different uh, versions of modernism. Um, he meets a lot of important people during this trip, Anton Hendricks being one, Willem van Koenenenberg being another, and essentially during this moment he decides that he is going to strike a blow on the Pretoria frontier, as he describes it. Uh, and when he gets back to Pretoria, he wants to paint in a more overtly avant-garde way. He wants to use all these post-impressionist, symbolist, falvist uh, influences he has just had in Europe uh, to paint, um, as I say, in a much more avant-garde spirit. And you see that in an incredible cassette uh, like this one here. This is, uh, this is Stellenbosch again, Jorgensuk again, and think back to the painting I showed you earlier from 1921 during his first uh, uh, exhibiting visit to Stellenbosch then, and think of how dramatically he has moved on in those short five years. This is from 1926. Look at this explosion of color on the facade of this mountainside. Also look at how it is depicted. It is not carefully uh, smeared uh, with, with oil paints. Um, it is not that dusky, hazy view of the mountain. It is an electric firework explosion of color. Look at those pinks, uh, those purples, all shot through with this incredible light. He is channeling the Falves here, of course. He is channeling the post-impressionists, and he's doing something quite spectacular and quite unique. Uh, certainly in the South African context. We think about all his geometric works. Well, they all come from this period between 1926, really, and 1928, when he is at his most avant-garde, his most experimental. Um, in many ways, he's also at his most unsuccessful. A lot of these works were poo-pooed by uh, the gallery-going public. Uh, I think a lot of critics were quite encouraging but more often than not, he couldn't sell these geometric paintings, which now are some of the greatest cultural treasures um, that we have in this country. In 1929 to 1932, he embarks on arguably the most important state commission in, in the 20th century in South Africa, his famous station panels. On the back of that success, he goes to London and he produces a number of very similar, but sometimes even bigger, uh, mural works for the then um, the, the Embassy South Africa House on Trafalgar Square, and he completes those by 1935 uh, when he's back in Pretoria. The work he produces thereafter in the 30s and 40s and early 50s are, are what we would describe as his mature works, works uh, that he has um, come to over the first two or, two or three decades of his career. A, formula, I suppose, that he knows works, that he knows sells, that he knows pleases his public. He reverts to a much more pastel uh, palette, um, a cream soda palette, uh, uh, as I like to call it, um, much more gentle, not nearly as explosive as his palette uh, in the 1920s. And we have a number of pretty incredible mature works uh, in the sale, trophy works, um, I would call them. Starting with a work like this, uh, a fabulous landscape with what might be pear trees or pear blossoms, but look at this incredible uh, line palette in a work like this. Of course, you have him looking carefully at the rock structure and this extensive landscape. It's a very, very gentle, subtle painting. I love the, uh, the coral elements in an aloe like this, uh, sort of a wintertime aloe, an aloe almost burnt by the sun. 
and these fabulous um, yellow and lime flecks uh, making up this incredible decorative, almost like a still life element uh, in a grand landscape. Here's another one. Um, I think the largest, the physically, the physically the largest work uh, in our sale. Another incredible uh, uh, landscape by Pina. I think to me quite a, a rugged, almost prehistoric kind of a landscape. Um, you see this fabulous decorative uh, dead tree with its large roots entrenched within this rock, uh, gripping this rock. Um, and then this fabulous mid-ground uh, where you have these uh, trees on the horizon line, uh, typical peony of trees again with this fabulous decorative element, and then this uh, uh, rocky um, mountainous landscape in the background. Peony of is course, of course famous for his cloudscapes and you have an incredible cloud burst above here. And I think uh, he takes as much care uh, in the solidity of the clouds and the sky as he does um, in the actual landscape itself. Very atmospheric painting, um, quite an unusual painting in many, many ways, in fabulous condition, uh, with enormous wall power. We love talking about wall power and Peony was a master at, at war power, and you get a real sense of that again in a work like this, despite it being in, in, in a very crisp, icy, all round palette. Of course, it's the winter in the bush felt, um, and I think you need to have spent time in the bush felt to realize how fabulously accurate and emotive and atmospheric a painting like this is. What are we seeing again? We're seeing his amazing ability to edit, condense, and simplify. Remember the drawings I showed you in Brits, uh, where he's picking up just the, uh, the, um, the trees that he wants to include in his composition. Of course, it's dominated uh, by this tree just off center uh, to the left, this fabulous fan and canopy um, that we are all uh, so very used to um, in South Africa. He's cutting out all the leaves on the lower section, though, to leave this uh, very decorative element. Um, we always talk about the tracery peony of creates, um, sort of lit up uh, by a fabulous uh, sky in the background. I love these colors. As I say, they are, they are crisp, they are wintry. Look at the mustards, the grays, the yellows. Um, everything is pulled back uh, with a, a tone, a shade of gray. Um, which gives it a, a real fabulous atmospheric quality. Talking about atmospheric qualities, uh, I don't think any paintings in this sale uh, capture atmospheric conditions quite like this one over here, this cloudburst storm. Um, I love this painting. You'll probably realize that because we used it in, in, in most of the, uh, the publicity. It's a late work. It's from 1952, so he's very much um, at the pinnacle of his career. Uh, but he's doing so many special things there. Yes, he's editing. Look at that, just that little, those few little trees there, with that fabulous dark shadow amongst this, uh, or within this sort of mustard band of landscape. And look at that fabulous little pink mountain, just catching the light. So yes, you have these clouds uh, moving high above the landscape. They are uh, putting all these mountains in shadow, but enough light breaks through just to touch on these fabulous pinks and greens in the foreground and to light up the central focal point. Um, it's a really quite fabulous painting. As are these just next to this work, an out and out trophy painting, a acacia in the bush felt, uh, ticks so many boxes uh, that you want from Pionier. Um, the tree itself, uh, I would argue, is much more geometric in the way it's produced. Look at these zigzagging lines in the branches. Uh, look at the amazing effect that creates in the background. Um, he hasn't put a cloud burst there, I think, because it might complicate things uh, in the composition with these little flecks of brown and russet uh, in, in, in this wintry uh, sort of tree canopy. Um, but the real interest in this work, the decorative interest in this work, is of course um, in, in the fabulous tracery uh, of, of this um, of this bushveld acacia. 
This work dates from 1943, and, and it's likely to be a landscape uh, near Nelspreet. This is an absolute jewel of a painting. You'll get a sense of its scale. I have pretty small hands, but you get a sense of, of, of its size. Uh, it, it's a real jewel. It's on board, which I think um, gives it that, that hard edge clarity and those beautiful, beautiful, rich colors. Um, it's a tapestry of a landscape. We, we love using that word, uh, a tapestry, uh, when we're talking about some of his landscapes. It's a, a patchwork of all these different colors. Yes, you get a sense of an agricultural element, an organized element uh, in this landscape, uh, but he pieces it together in all these uh, opposing, um, gently contrasting colors. So you have uh, these brown elements, these mustard elements, uh, and also these uh, different shades of green making up uh, this quilt of the landscape. Quite geometric in many ways, but it also has this fabulous sort of Art Nouveau uh, sinuous line, this road moving through the landscapes around these uh, little copies, which remind me a lot about the, the previous picture I just showed you, all the way through the landscape uh, to these background blue mountains. Of course, you have uh, the ubiquitous uh, cloud burst um, in the top section. The other little detail I love is his signature. I love the colour of that signature. He hasn't tried to hide it. He's proudly signed off in this blue purple. And again, it's just another little shock in the landscape that uh, in many ways helps uh, tie the whole thing together. It's a quite fabulous painting. Just one or two more before I stop. Um, this is a very unusual painting, I think, by Pirinev uh, from the early 1940s, 1941. There are a few things I'd like to say about this. Uh, this is uh, the mission, the Morofontein mission near Nalström. It no longer exists, but there's some fabulous contrasts uh, in this work. Of course, um, the reference to, to vernacular architecture that um, intrigued Pirinev his whole life, uh, again, conflated with a church. Um, and a work like this really brings home how much time Pin have spent um, very carefully organizing his compositions. I mentioned Willem van Kanenenberg, who was the theorist and artist Pirniev met in Holland in 1925. Um, and I think his theories still have a massive effect in a painting like this. Um, Willem van Kanenenberg had a very mathematical approach to composition, which, which had a, a big impact on Pirniev, uh, where he would try and mathematically work out the best formulas, uh, the most eye-catching formulas for his compositions. Um, you talk a lot about middle points, focal points, diagonals, intersecting lines, and this is a perfect example. Um, if you think about the uh, diagonal lines from corner to corner and where they intersect, well, they intersect pretty much right at the top of that steeple. Again, emphasizing what is uh, perhaps in Pianius' mind uh, the most important element uh, in this work, which is, of course, the church uh, in the middle of this uh, fabulous rural landscape. Very unusual. I also love the fact that it's painted in 1941. We don't think of Pirniev as a war artist, and of course he wasn't a uh, traditional official war artist, but he was painting South Africa um, during both world wars. Uh, and he doesn't, uh, well, I don't wanna say he doesn't give enough credit for that, but we don't look uh, hard enough at the work he produced, this um, incredible body of wartime work he produced between 1914 and 1918, and then again between 1939 and 1945. I think one of the last works I'll talk about Another fabulous trophy work uh, from 1953, so shortly after he painted that fabulous cloudburst storm, uh, this is Clouds Over the Karoo. Again, there's so many things I love about this painting. I, I think first and foremost, it's the clouds, this incredible architectonic depiction of clouds. When you think of the great cloudscape painters, if you think of uh, Constable, for instance, uh, in the European tradition, you can only think of Pirniev in the South African context. Nobody painted clouds with the kind of solidity, the kind of power, the kind of 
uh, atmosphere uh, as Pierneuf did, and this is, uh, I would argue, a pretty incredible example. I love how all these different clouds, painted in different shades of grey and cream and blue and lavender, uh, seem to almost be like stage sets uh, moving between themselves uh, at different speeds and at different times. So you have this, this massive white burst in the background and these darker clouds moving quickly, uh, as I say, almost like stage sets um, across the landscape, across the skyscape. He's also chosen to put this register of mountains quite low down, uh, giving um, a real focus on the clouds. But you have these fabulous two registers uh, on, uh, on the bottom third uh, of the canvas. The near foreground, um, quite abstract in the way it's painted, peaches, corals, greens, browns, uh, it's the kind of section of a painting you don't look at immediately, but the more you focus on it, the more it delights the eye. There are so many colors here, so many different shades, so many different directions in brushstroke, it really is quite mesmerizing. And then perhaps the tour de force uh, in this painting is the fabulous light speckles um, on this mountainside. Remember that little uh, coral mountain um, I showed you in Cloudburst Storm, this is very similar, um, but still in a slightly different way. There isn't uh, just a flat light um, on these hills and copies, it's much more dappled. Um, again, you get a sense of light just sneaking through some of these clouds as they move through the sky and just lighting up uh, these edges and ridges um, in a painting like this. Fabulous painting. As is this, which if I'm honest, I think this might be my favorite painting. Um, it's of Roy Platt or, or Röder Platt, um, and it's most likely painted in the late 1920s, maybe early 1930s. And in many ways, this period is Pierneus most exciting. He is back from Europe, of course, early in 1926. And in that moment, he's experimenting with so many things. He's ex experimenting with uh, geometric elements. Uh, he's experimenting with different falvus colors and palettes. And he's experimenting with divisionism. And you see that in a painting like this. Of course, I think at a glance, you'd think about uh, impressionism, post-impressionism. And of course, it's all part of the same family. But, but Pierneuf was spe specifically interested in this idea of divisionism or pointillism, the idea of taking pure spots of color uh, and, and, and putting them across a landscape, across a canvas uh, to create uh, an immediate impact. And he does this so spectacularly in a small scale work like this. Now, we have a webinar coming up um, where we talk about Pierneuf in a more international context, speaking about him uh, specifically uh, linked to the Canadian Group of Seven, which was a marvelous group of Canadian landscape painters working uh, before the First World War and after the First World War uh, on the frontiers of, of, of Canada's great uh, wilderness and parks. And they were painting in a very similar way, a very raw, real, direct way uh, to what Pierneuf is doing here. You can imagine Pierneuf um, on the banks. He would make these fabulous uh, sort of outdoor studios with reeds and you get a real sense of him um, almost hidden in the reeds, painting a little window uh, of what was in front of him. So you get this amazing sensation of grasses and reeds in the winter blowing, moving colors around, uh, light flicking off different foliage, um, the reeds changing from gold to brown to red uh, as they move in the light. And you have this fabulous water in the midground, the trees to the right, and then look at that midground, um, these hills uh, in the background, which are built up with quite deliberate strokes of purple and pink and mauve. He also uses a lot of electric green and lime in a work like this, which you would use much later in that uh, fabulous lime landscape I showed you a little bit earlier. Look at the sky also, these fabulous little cross hatches. There is so much variety of color in the sky. And of course, it darkens uh, as it moves up sort of heavenward, it's much lighter on the horizon, 
greens, limes, turquoises, purples even, all different angles and flecks of, of, of his brush stroke, moving all the way up to a much darker register of blue in the top. I think if you snuck this painting into the McMichael collection uh, just outside of Toronto uh, and you try to pass it off as a sketch by one of the famous Canadian group of seven, I think it would fit in absolutely perfectly. Uh, it's a fabulous, fabulous painting from a very important period in his career. Which brings us back to where we started. Um, another one of my favorite works in the sale, probably from a similar time. And again, you, you get a sense of his uh, devotion to mathematics and geometry during this period uh, after his return to Europe. A work like this is squared up. Uh, you see all these little uh, squares. Uh, that was a way of translating a sketch like this to a much greater scale, potentially to a mural size uh, work. We don't know exactly uh, what the plan for this work is, uh, whether it was maybe related to some of his large scale murals for the Johannesburg Railway Station or indeed for London, but a painting like this has so much of the best of Peonius' most avant-garde spirit. Yes, these fabulous colors, those rich, deep electric blues, these spots of punctuating the landscape, but also this fabulous facade of these uh, different facets of color, fragmented, geometric, um, with incredible impact, painted quite flatly in watercolor with different grades of, of peach and yellow and lime. Um, Look at the way this uh, kraal is enclosed with these very architectural elements in this rock formation, moving around uh, this kraal or this boma. Fabulous painting. Again, you get a real sense of how he worked, um, how ahead of his time he was uh, in so many ways. Um, and we're incredibly privileged, I think, to be able to see a work like this in this fabulous context alongside uh, drawings, liner cuts, etchings, watercolors, and of course the grand uh, monumental oil paintings of which we have so many fabulous examples. I'm going to stop there. Um, yeah, thank you so much for watching all the way to the end if you have. Um, Please have a look at our catalog. Um, it's a gently narrative catalog from the beginning of his career all the way to the end. 50 years of spectacular Pirni of art making. Uh, the sale itself is on Monday the 26th of this month. Um, so in a week's time. We're very excited to be bringing something like this to the market. Uh, and, and we hope all our clients and friends um, enjoy it.